Hello again, everybody. Michael Tomaski here. I'm the editor of The New Republic. This is the new edition of Tomaski Cast, and I'm joined, as you can see, by Congressman Ruben Gallego of Arizona. Congressman, hello. Hello. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for uh, agreeing to come and talk to me. Uh, one reason I wanted to have you is that you have a new book out, uh, and I've seen you promoting it on cable news, and it sounded interesting to me, so I wanted to talk to you about that. Uh, it's, uh, the title is uh, They Called Us Lucky, and it's about your service in Iraq. So uh, with that, just go to it. Tell people what the book is. <laughs> well, it's not just about my service in Iraq. It's about the service of these great men that I served with. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, I served with a unit that ended up seeing the most casualties of the Iraq War. Uh, you know, an experience that was horrifying to me, but more importantly, it was horrifying to, you know, hundreds of men of Lima 325, uh, these Marines that were from all over the country, but largely focused out of Arizona, New Mexico, and Ohio. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's who I served with. Um, that's where I met my best friend, Jonathan Grant, who also died in the war. Um, and it was an experience that, um, you know, really changed me, but changed mm -hmm. everybody. So the story is really about us and story about it is about how we survived the war, what we went through, but also how we survived the post-war. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just, you know, parades and, you know, tear talk parades. Uh, when you get back from war, a lot of what you unfortunately have to deal with is these like demons that you will see many, many years later. Mm -hmm. And so the, the book is actually talking about that. So it's a realistic version of war and it's a realistic version of war from the perspective of a young person, uh, enlisted person, not a high speed, low drag, like Navy SEAL or an officer. This is what yeah. real war is, because most war is actually conducted by usually 18, 19, 20 year olds. Yeah. This was a Marine Corps battalion, correct? Right. right. Yep. And you enlisted, if I'm uh, correct, you enlisted in peacetime, right? In, in, mm -hmm. in 2000? Yeah. yeah, I enlisted in 2000. Uh, it was the summer of um, 2000. I just got kicked out of Harvard. Um, you know, had a, you know, had a, not such a great academic career at this point, uh, but, uh, you know, Harvard asked me to take a little break. And um, honestly, I had always just wanted to serve my country and realizing that I had a little break, uh, I decided to do it, decided to join the Marine Corps Reserves, right? Yeah. And I, I was not naive. I knew at some point I would get activated. I never, I never thought that that would not happen. I just never thought I would end up being in a unit you know, that ended up seeing some of the, most, the hardest combat ever uh, of the war. Um, but, you know, I, I did my job. I, I loved my country. I was still in my country and they asked me to go to war. So I did. But uh, yeah, I didn't serve. A lot of people are confused. I think I joined, you know, after 9-11 yeah. you know, in response to, uh, you know, the, the terrorist attacks. So I, I joined because I always wanted to serve. Um, it's just that my service ended up happening after 9-11. I see. And you grew up in Chicago, correct? I did. Yeah. South Side Chicago. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and went off to Harvard. That's pretty good. Um, so uh, tell me more about your, um, you know, your wartime experience. I mean, you saw some heavy stuff, I gather. Yeah, I mean, I saw some heavy stuff. I mean, and, and you know, the, the thing about war is like every man's perspective or woman's perspective is very different. And I saw some heavy stuff. And then there's other people in my company that saw even heavier stuff, right? There's, yeah. uh, you know, for example, in our, in our book, we talk about a place called Hell House. Hell House is an ambush house that the, you know, uh, Iraqis had, Iraqis had set. And, you know, we had to send men into the meat grinder to try to get other men out. I never was there. I was actually, you know, one block over trying to get over there. Uh, but, you know, I gave you the perspective of everybody that was trying to go into that house to get other guys out. Um, and then, you know, there's times at war where like, we're just, you know, irreverent young men trying to have fun, playing pranks on each other, yeah. or just trying to, try to make decisions about the future, not knowing if we're going to be alive, right? Yeah. You know, so the book is really a, a perspective on, you know, young men at war, um, you know, and and also young men that don't have power. One of the things, you know, you, you forget while you're reading the book is that that I'm, you know, a member of Congress because like I don't talk about policy positions. I don't talk about how this could change or that could change because that's not the feeling I had when I was, you know, at that age and powerless and, you know, getting you know shot at and killed at or killed, uh, you know, attempted killed by by the insurgents. Yeah. Uh, and you write uh, your battalion consists of about 185 men and, and you lost about a quarter of them. Is that correct? Yeah, about a quarter to one third. We have it. Uh, and we say lost. We ended up, uh, you know, what I mean by that is they ended up getting killed or wounded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so how long were you in Iraq? I was there for uh, close to six to seven months. Uh, so it's which is 
kind of common, I think, for a lot of infantry uh, companies uh, at that point in terms of Marines, uncommon uh, how much uh, combat, unfortunately, that uh, we was saw, we ended up seeing. Yeah, yeah. What's the main lesson you took away from that experience? Well, you know, one of you know the titles they called us lucky, um, and uh, you know, with with air quotes around lucky, and the reason we ended up doing the title of that is because you know the war ends up being all about luck, right? It's not mm-hmm. your skill. You know, some of the smartest, strongest men die just as just as much as like this. You know, some of the weakest, you know, uh, not smart men survive, right? The mm-hmm. war because it's all about your your luck, and it's a very unfortunate thing because. I don't like that, right? I, you know, my best friend in the war, John the Grand, dies, and he dies, you know, for really random luck. And as a matter of fact, the the the, the bomb, you want to call it a bomb, ends up ends up killing him. Should have actually killed me. And it's just random luck that it ended right. up killing him first. Why, why didn't Why didn't it? Where Where were you? Oh, uh, we were in the western Iraq, and these um, we were pushing through um, this small little village into a an operation, and the the IED that went off um on him should have actually gone off on us because it was um it was triggered by you know these types of mines that were basically triggered by the vehicle since this were the first vehicle to go through we should have it should have gone off on us and not not on him and unfortunately that's war right Mm -hmm. and so the question is like what happens in war why does it happen why did why does he die who's got two kids and you know i survived at that point we had no kids right Mm -hmm. um you know so again luck and fortune and chance play a, play a big kind of theme uh, in this whole uh, book. Yeah, yeah. And, and what made you want to write the book? And, and what you know, what do you want people to to take from it? Well, I didn't write. The, I did not want to write the book. Mm-hmm. Actually, like the the book was extremely painful to write. I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I suffered from PTSD. I didn't suffer from PTSD for you know, many years. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I started real therapy to PTSD. Then I was finally, I would say, um, in the mindset to, to actually start talking about this. And my, you know, my brothers had always asked me to, to, to write the book. Um, they had tried to write the book. They had tried to get them published. It, it hadn't happened. <clears throat> like I remember Congress, at least I have like one step above or at least one more chance than anyone else did. And uh, I wanted to do it. And honestly, a lot of, we did it because, or I did it, and, but with the help of a lot of friends, including uh, you know, my co-author, uh, Jim Tiffelis, uh, mm-hmm. and then you know, five or six of my uh, brothers, we did it because we're just dying. Like a lot of us are dying right now. You know, two of the you know, men that I talk about in the book, for example, Captain Knapp and uh, uh, Sergeant Major Altieri died during the editing process of this book. Oh my. Yeah, you know, men and women, the men that I serve with are, are just dying all the time. And I wanted them to have a legacy. And, um, you know, I was finally in the, the actual mental position to do it. And that's why I did it. Wow. Are these suicides or what? No, the, the last two, unfortunately, are, are not. Uh, well, for, uh, yeah. There's no fortune, unfortunate, but they're not suicides. But there have been suicides. There have been suicides, you know, within our within our company. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, so you get back stateside. Uh, you went back to Harvard, or what? Oh, so I, I went to Harvard. <clears throat> no, I went to Harvard even before I went to Iraq. So, no, but I mean, uh, yeah, I got back. kicked out of Harvard. Uh, yeah. Joined the Marine Corps uh, Reserves. Finished all my training, boot camp, uh, school of Institute training, and then I applied back to get into Harvard. That's one of the things we yeah. get kicked out. You could, so I applied back into get to Harvard. Apply, get in. Uh, they accept me back in. So I go back to school. And while I'm at Harvard, I do my one week in a month, two weeks a year, like, you know, every other, you know, any other reservist uh, does yeah. across the country, except I'm doing it from, from Harvard. Uh, and then, uh, you know, eventually graduate. And then after about nine months of the graduation, I ended up get, going to Iraq. <clears throat> I see. Okay. Uh, and then, so after military service, uh, how did you get back to Arizona and get the politics bug? Well, after military service, I moved to Arizona just because I just couldn't uh, move back to New Mexico. I had when I joined uh, Lima three twenty five, I had moved to New Mexico for a job, and I joined the nearest military, uh, sorry, Marine Corps unit. And that Marine Corps unit happened to be Delta Company, and Delta Company ended up going to 
Iraq. Yeah. When I got back, um, I'd always have I'd always planned to live in New Mexico with my my best friend Jonathan Grant, raise our families together nearby, all that kind of stuff. And yeah. really, after he died and after the trauma of the war, I just New Mexico was just not a place that I could live anymore. Um, there's too many uh, dead memories there that would that would always haunt me. Uh, and I knew it always haunt me and I, and I, and I needed a new fresh start. Uh, so a, a, a place where I didn't have, you know, friends that you know, didn't make it of houses that I didn't build of, you know, you know, relationships that, that died. Uh, so I moved to New Mexico. Um, and that point, my, my girlfriend was there working uh, and um, I just needed to get out of New Mexico. And uh, so moved to Arizona. Yeah. 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 You yeah, no, yeah. yeah, that's why she was she was working in Arizona and, yeah. and I just needed to really just I, I couldn't live anymore in New Mexico. New Mexico was a dead place to me when you yeah. know and also died. Yeah. Uh, so how did you get into politics? So, I mean, I got into politics largely. I mean, I've always kind of been a political person by nature, but because of, you know, a lot of veterans issues, you know, the fact that our veterans were you know, not veterans, like, and I mean, veterans are veterans. I mean, my veterans, my friends couldn't get access to the VA. Uh, I couldn't get access to the VA. We couldn't get jobs. I mean, it was all these things that just kept on adding up. And, um, you know, one of the things that I at least knew or felt was that, you know, if you have a Harvard degree, you have at least a little certain more privilege than your average Marine. And so I used that to, you know, get my friends the services they need, the, you know, the jobs that they need or whatever it is. Uh, and eventually it became a level of activism. And after activism, it became a little, somewhat of a level of political, um, you know, I would say like a, a, a political pointy, pointy position where I would just advise other uh, politicians. And eventually those politicians asked me to run for office. Yeah. So tell folks when you first got elected to Congress and where your district is. Well, I first got to Congress in uh, November of 2014. Uh, I was in Phoenix, uh, South Phoenix, Glendale, uh, Tolleson, uh, and Guadalupe, uh, and of course, Central Phoenix. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you're in your, what, fifth term? Fourth, fourth term. term. Fourth term. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So let's talk about what's been going on in Congress lately, which is quite a lot. Um, uh, the big bill finally passed. Uh, uh, first of all, how much of Kevin McCarthy's speech did you sit through? None. <laughs> None. No, I, it, was, it was my, it was even my birthday. So I went out with my friends to celebrate uh, when I heard that he was doing, uh, you know, he was doing some type of uh, uh, colloquy on, or a filibuster. Yeah. I was not going to sit around. He's not the brightest man in the world. And I'm certainly not going to sit around and listen to him read from comics. Yeah. He's just not going to really sit there and enlighten you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what are, uh, uh, to you, uh, your favorite parts of Build Back Better or the parts that you are most excited about? <clears throat> you know, coming from like a working class family slash poor family, I really think the child care tax credit, the child care subsidies are going to be extremely important. It's going to you know lift about 50 percent of children that are in poverty out of poverty. Yeah. That's got amazing long term uh, you know, consequences. I mean, if, if I had had my mom had had this, it probably would have, you know, changed her world. And she did really well. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. She raised four kids on her own. All four went to college. We're all middle class, all middle class. We have one doctor, all that. So she did really well, but I'm sure she could have done without the stress of it. Right. Yeah. And then, um, uh, the childcare subsidies. I mean, I know we had just very regular childcare growing up where we had to rely on neighbors, we had to rely on, you know, family members, and it caused a lot of stress on my mom. And, and she probably could have focused more on her career uh, and actually ended up, you know, saving money because, you know, she, how much money she spent on childcare or didn't spend on childcare by giving us, put us in these informal uh, settings that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for people like her, you know, you know, middle class, single parents, or, you know, that, that they could succeed. And she just did it. So this is a really good opportunity really for, for, you know, you know, poor working class parents to really, you know, move uh, in this economy and, and their children to move too. So uh, how is the child care uh, provision going to be implemented? I mean, is, is, does it mean that a bunch of new centers are going to be created around the country and, and um, new, new people hired and so on? No, it's going to be direct subsidies to, to, to people that are, you know, uh, going to be using it and it'll be capped at 7% of your annual budget, 
uh, and if you you know want to participate in one of these programs, you have to basically cap your uh, your costs uh, in terms of your uh, annual cost per per kid. Now, yeah. obviously, there's going to be not an easy uh, transition to it, uh, but it's going to create a lot of new uh, centers that are really been missing. And, during the recession, you know, one of the things that we noticed, um, or the during the pandemic, because of uh, because of the pandemic and the recession of that, there's just a lot of childcare centers that just shut down, yeah. because the average you know uh, childcare worker makes twelve bucks an hour, and they have kids on their own, yeah. and when when uh, you know when the pandemic shut them down, they never came back because they came back, <clears throat> excuse me, they had twelve bucks an hour, <clears throat> they got paid twelve bucks an hour, and they couldn't you know find a job that really uh, you know, can make them go back to work. So a lot of them never came back to childcare. They never they ended up going back to some other type of retail work. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to find childcare now. So this is going to give them better pay, um, give the owners uh, a little more stability. And then of course, give the parents more stability so they actually have real uh, options. Yeah. And you mentioned that the, the, the climate uh, portions are, are important mm-hmm. to you as well. Well, look, we're from Arizona. We're in a severe seven-year drought at this point. Um, you know, we have to start cutting down our water, <clears throat> uh, our, our water uh, usage, especially in, in rural areas. Um, if we don't deal with climate, if we don't actually deal with the severe effects of climate change, you know, Arizona is going to be a non-livable place in about 50 years. So uh, when we talk about climate change legislation, anything that reduces our carbon footprint, um, it and and also invests in you know water conservation, uh, you know, or just like in general being able to have more renewable energy. That's extremely helpful to places like Arizona. Yeah. So let me ask you about the politics of it heading into the midterms. You know, you're from a safe district. You're not going to have a, I wouldn't think a, a, a you know formidable Republican challenge. But what if you were from a from a purple district and faced such such a challenge? And and what do you think about you know, your colleagues in those kinds of districts, um, you know, uh, there's a sense that, you know, it's going to be hard for the Democrats to sell this uh, before the midterms. A lot of it's mm-hmm. not going to be on track yet and so on and so on. So w- w- what do you think the, 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 the political way to, to try and turn this to your party's advantage would be? Well, look, historically speaking, Democrats or the party uh, in power in the White House loses uh, the midterm elections. So we're always going to be uh, on the downward slope. But if we're going to buck history, if we're going to mitigate the losses, you need to have a reason. You're not going to have a reason by not doing anything. Right. You're certainly not going to have a reason by not doing anything that especially that doesn't affect the coalitions that we need to come out and vote. It's great that we have an infrastructure bill. But that infrastructure bill only it really helps a small percentage of the population directly, those workers. And those workers, you know, a lot of them don't even vote, you know, Democratic or vote at all, right? Mm-hmm. But our coalition, you know, especially like growing families, diverse families, uh, poor families from all over the country uh, need to get a reason to vote. They need to show, we need to show that there is a reason you vote Democratic because we will actually have material change to your life. So if there's any chance we have at all, we have to pass the Build Back Better agenda. You know, just the child tax credit alone, there are millions of people that'll be looked at our poverty uh, by just doing that. If we don't give these people an argument why it's important to, to elect Democrats and we elect Democrats, um, then they're just not going to come out and vote. They have better things going on with their life. So this is our best shot. Uh, you know, so politically is our best shot. And there's just for, you know, our, you know, pure roles as, as good Americans. This is one of the few chances we have probably in decades where we can do transformative legislation that's going to lift people out of poverty. You just don't get to do that that often uh, as Democrats, uh, but this is the opportunity to do it and we should take it. You feel okay about its chances in the Senate now? I feel better about it. You know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see, but I definitely feel better about it. So let's wrap up here. Speaking of the Senate, there's a certain Senator from your state who's been getting a lot of attention lately. Uh, first of all, what, what, in, to you, motivates Kirsten Cinema? Oh, I don't know. Nobody does. <laughs> yeah. um, there's been talk, of course, that uh, you'd be a good uh, candidate to maybe run a primary against her. Uh, she's up in 2024. I've seen polls where you're ahead of her, uh, uh, head to head. Uh, does this interest you? Look, you know, what interests me is, is serving, you know, 
the people of my district uh, and the people of Arizona. Right now, focus is on 2022, winning re-election, passing the Build Back Better agenda. 2024 is a long time from now. I'm not going to say no to the future. Uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, and at the end of the day, I never say you know no to my constituents. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, in the meantime, just want to focus on uh, you know 2022 and, and and getting that done well. Yeah, and finally, speaking of Arizona in 2024, uh, what could be done to protect uh, people's votes uh, with all that's going on that Republicans are trying to do in your state? Pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, you have it's not just Arizona, it's everywhere in this country. There's going to be a there, there is an all else out on, on voting rights and, and voters. Uh, and uh, if you if you believe in democracy and you want to see democracy preserved, pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Representative Ruben Gallego, uh, the book is called They Called Us Lucky, and he is, of course, a member of Congress. Um, sir, thank you for your time. Thank you.